2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. Paul writes, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now, those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And so at this point, the Apostle Paul is closing his letter with an exhortation. And the exhortation is to believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I might as well introduce this study by letting you know that we're going to spend a good amount of time in verse 6 and develop that in a little, little more fullness than normal. And you'll see that in just a moment. But as we look at this, as is my usual practice when I teach, I want to develop a context. Now, Paul had written in this chapter, notice verse 4, he had said, We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. So he had just written specifically concerning the things that uh, he knows of them, that they are obedient to the commands of the Lord and all. But he's saying we're confident that you're going to do these things because he's specifically going to give some orders in just a moment. And he expects them to believe these, uh, rather to do these orders, to obey these orders that he's giving. Now, I want to develop a foundation for you because in, in our day, the church is not regarded in the same way in many ways in terms of its organizational structure. It's not really seen for what it is. It isn't seen in a biblical uh, sense by, by quite a number of people. So I want to develop something so you have an understanding of why he's giving orders and the kind of order he's going to give. And, and I realize that not everybody would be very interested in such a, such a study, but it's important to know these things so you can understand what church life is really all about. And the question would have to be, even as he's giving commands, the question has to be, why should they obey his, his orders? Why should he do that? Well, we need to remember that the church itself has been founded on the apostles, prophets, and the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's what Ephesians tells us. The 12 apostles were part of the foundation of the early church. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And so the church is developed as an organization. And it's founded on apostolic doctrine. Now, Paul was an apostle, and he exercised what has been called apostolic authority under the direction of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he would give commands to the body of Christ, to so the church. Now, Paul knew that giving spiritual orders was something as an apostle he was to do, and it wasn't something that he would do in a fleshly manner. He didn't want to be somebody who dominated over other people. He was actually wanting to be known as someone who helps you in your walk with the Lord. When he was writing to the Corinthians, I'll give you an example. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, this is what he said. He said, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. So we're not dominating you. We're not giving you orders so that we can just bully you. No, we want you to grow. We're workers for your joy. By faith, you're going to stand. So he knew that he could give direct orders, but he preferred giving these orders in a way that was encouraging to those he was giving orders to. You can see a good example of this in one of the books of the New Testament called the book of Philemon. In that book, he gives Philemon directions. Now, to give it a context so I can develop the, the uh, illustration, Philemon had a runaway slave by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus had come to faith through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So when that took place, Paul had told Onesimus to return to Philemon. But Onesimus, the runaway slave, was hesitant. He knew he could suffer great consequences. During that day, he could even be put to death. And so the idea of going back 
as a Christian was something he didn't want to do. And so what this does is it encourages Paul, provokes him to write a letter, and he writes the letter. It's really on behalf of the runaway slave. And in it, he's encouraging Philemon, the slave owner. He's encouraging Philemon not to punish Onesimus, but actually, he says, to welcome him back. Now, in Philemon, in chapter 1, it says this in verses 8 through 10. And he's speaking to him, and he says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is, it is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Paul had brought him to faith in Christ, and so he's referring to him as a son in the faith. Now, he made it very clear. He said, I can order you. I could have, he says, I could order you, but I'm not. Instead, I'm reasoning with you with love. So Paul had authority in the church, and many people didn't respond to it. There were people who had problems with it. Some did respond well, but others didn't. Not all in the church recognized his authority, and some even went so far as to reject his authority, even though he was an apostle. Some of them even considered themselves not only his equals, but even superior to him. And they would speak out against his authority. And so you have a lot of books in the New Testament where Paul is actually writing to deal with the contentions that are coming because people refuse to be under, under biblical and apostolic authority. And so there are people, there are letters, for example, letters to like the Galatians, where Paul has to correct some errors. And there is another uh, letter that was written, we're familiar with the letter to the Corinthians. And, and he had to write a letter and he had to encourage him to be obedient to the commands. Some in the church worldwide were actually rebelling against his leadership. And some of them, uh, Paul even refers to and speaks of them as being false apostles. Again, in 2 Corinthians 11, 12, and 13, he said, I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us and the things they boast about. For such people, he says, are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And so he made it clear he's not giving fleshly commands here in 2 Thessalonians. He is making it clear that his directions are inspired and directed by the Holy Spirit. Paul wasn't a tyrant. Paul was one who exercised authority in a direct way, but in an encouraging way. And as an apostle, the commands he gave were through the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this portion, he's commanding them, again, in the name of the Lord Jesus. The church is not to think that they can rebel against the command. They would not be rebelling against human authority. They are actually rebelling against the Lord himself. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, he had said, If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. And so this emphasizes the seriousness of his orders that he's issuing them. And so in verse 6, he begins by saying, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something serious is happening in the church. It is so, and we're going to de develop this, it is so serious that Paul commands them to withdraw from people. Now when he says we command you to withdraw, that word withdraw is a word that speaks of cautiously drawing away from someone. It's a word that was used to describe a military commander silently avoiding a confrontation. What Paul is saying to withdraw from is to withdraw socially from those who are referring to themselves, calling themselves believers who are walking in a disorderly fashion. We'll see that in a moment. But it's a very serious command when you say to somebody you need to withdraw socially. But he gave that kind of command to the church again in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. He said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. 
But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone, listen, who claims to be a brother or a sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? You hear the term, don't judge me, bro. Well, Paul says, are you not to judge those? Are you not to have the discernment to know who is walking right with the Lord and who's not, who's violating what God's word says and who isn't? He says, God will judge those outside, expel the wicked person from among you. That is church discipline. Now, normally, believers are encouraged to maintain fellowship. Gathering together is the practice of the early church. They would all be together, gathered together, and they would be in the apostolic doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. They would be together in that. And so that was the, the manner of the early church. And so normally, believers are commanded not to avoid fellowship. And when we had the COVID thing, you know, a few years ago now that we all still remember, some less than others, but when, when we had that COVID thing going, and, uh, you know, you could go to a tattoo parlor or you could go to a club, but you couldn't go to church. We were commanded not to fellowship by the government. And many of us looked at that at first because we didn't know it was taking place with with this uh, new virus and all. So we exercise the wisdom that God gives us to make sure that what we do should be in line with what we know. And for us, many of you will remember that we took off about three weeks of Sundays and then we began to gather again. We just didn't make it public. We just did that because the scripture says in Hebrews 10, 25, do not give up meeting together as some are in the ha habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so we have been commanded to gather. And yet he's saying withdraw. Now he had just said, we saw it in verse 4, that they had a habit of obeying spiritual commands. But now he's issuing, issuing a command that's going to be diff difficult to keep. But necessary to obey because he's commanding the church to withdraw or draw away from someone. He says it again, verse 6, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. So what is he so concerned about that would tell them not to fellowship with these people? He's concerned because they're walking in what he calls a disorderly manner. Now what does disorderly mean? It means undisciplined. It speaks literally of being out of rank. It can be used of speaking of soldiers. When I was in the military and we were going through uh, basic training and later on when we had to march together, we were supposed to mark, uh, march in orders. We had our columns and all of that. And we had someone calling out what they call cadence, you know, to the left, to the left, to the left, right, left. Why'd they have to do that? Because there's guys who march to the right, to the left. That's, they, they're backwards. And you'll be stumping, you, we would bump into each other. So they'd have to yell out to the left, to the left, to the left, left, right, left. And so that meant our left foot was going forward. Someone who's walking disorderly is walking out of ranks. They're not walking in unison and they're causing disruption. It's, uh, it's, it speaks of living a life that is contrary to what the scripture teaches. And so what he's saying is there are some in the congregation who are still refusing to hold a job. And he's saying that they're not walking according to the tradition that they'd received. Now, I mentioned to you the tradition is the systematic teaching of the gospel message. This tradition that he's speaking about speaks of the whole counsel of God, uh, what they have received and what they are receiving. Now, in the first letter, he had, had given the church a command concerning this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, he had said, We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So uh, apparently this problem has not been resolved. And so because the problem is ongoing, Paul now has to take a stronger tone. And he makes it clear that those undermining the faith are to receive discipline. Okay, so today, when you say that, you get all kinds of people upset. 
They're saying, that's what I don't like about you Christians. You're so harsh and judgmental. The fact that Paul would issue such a command to actually withdraw disturbs people. I can still remember many years ago I was teaching through 1 Corinthians, and it was a portion that was dealing with church discipline as we are today. And as I read the portion of Scripture, began to explain it, I said, I, by, by raising your hand, I said to them, how many of you think it is harsh what Paul is telling them to do? And how many of you think that the church should not do what he's saying? And I was um, surprised in a way to see that out of the, the, the people who were there, a good portion raised their hand and said, oh, it's just harsh. He shouldn't do that. They were actually arguing with the Word of God because of the sociological ramifications, because they thought that was harsh and judgmental when, in fact, they didn't understand why he would do something like that. I believe that part of their uh, misunderstanding was a, a, a lack of really understanding what grace is. And it also was rooted in a misunderstanding of what a Christian and what church is. And they don't realize, and sometimes people don't realize, that we are to be a light to a, a confused and a darkened world. And so with all of this, the real issue was a, a misunderstanding of grace a misunderstanding of the purpose of the church, and also a misunderstanding uh, of, of spiritual leadership. Well, that's understandable in some ways because people say, well, there's a lot of spiritual abuse, and that person can take advantage and all, and I don't want to be hurt, and that's understandable. But they also need to understand what the reason for this is. What is the purpose? And that's something that has to be developed, and I'll take another step further with that to develop this a bit further and, and tell you that er, in the early church, God established leadership, and the leadership was to care for the body of Christ. Remember how Jesus was speaking to the apostle Peter, and he had said to him, Peter, do you love me? And then Peter said, you know all things, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said, tend and feed my, my sheep, tend and care for my lambs. And so that's called pastoral leadership, and it's to be done in a tender and a loving way. And so Peter had learned that lesson, and he passed it on to future pastors. In 1 Peter 5, 2, 2 and 3, it says, Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, being examples to the flock. So Peter served, and he was encouraging the leadership to serve willingly, don't, don't be greedy. Be eager. Don't lord it over those entrusted. Be an example. So pastors are to serve as examples of the Christian life. We're not to excuse ourselves from God's commands. Now, obviously, none of us is perfect. Only Jesus is the perfect shepherd. Yet, we're to be living lives that are examples of what a believer is like. Hebrews 13, verse 7 Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So for pastors, the greatest concern is for the sheep to follow closely after the Lord. And when spiritual commands are given, they're intended to help the sheep in order that they might grow. In 1 Corinthians 7.35, Paul said, This I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So the reason that we have these parameters and the reason he's saying that we have this biblical authority and why we hold you to the scripture is so your life will be blessed. You know that old saying, you know, when you, if you're a parent, you might have said something similar. You might have said just before you applied the Board of Education to the Seat of Understanding. <laughs> this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And then the kid says, then hit yourself, you know. <laughs> but when you do issue those kinds of things, when you have to bring that to bear 
That's a very difficult thing. Nobody wants to lord it over or should. No pastor, true pastor, no true shepherd should ever want to lord it over, but we want to be helpers of, of their joy. And we have to give an account. According to Hebrews 13, 17, the scripture says, Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and, and not with grief. That would be unprofitable for you. I actually, as a shepherd in this fellowship, have the responsibility to do those things, and I will give an account for the lives of those God entrusted to me. And so Paul's intention is to safeguard the church and to correct the error. In order to do that, he has to remove that which is causing the problem. It's a leaven that infects. Galatians 5, 9 says, a little yeast or a little leaven works through the whole batch of dough. And so he's saying, withdraw yourself, notice in verse 6, from every brother who walks disorderly. Withdraw, he says, from believers who live an undisciplined life. In the church, there are those habitually violating clear teachings of Scripture. Normally, when that comes to our attention, my attention, we'll see, normally a conversation is, is pretty much sufficient. Just sit down and say, listen, I'm concerned for you. I've noticed that this is something you've been doing. And, uh, you know, this is what the Word of God says. And I'd like to encourage you to be obedient to what God says. And I'll be honest with you. Overwhelmingly, people will listen and say, didn't think about it. I want to be right with the Lord, and we move on. But sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes people will continue, and that begins to infect other people. Again, it's what we just read with uh, a little leaven leavening the whole lump. And so discipline is intended to prevent sin from spreading, as well as preserving the unity and holiness of the body of Christ. It, it's intended to not destroy, but to restore someone who's sinning, as well as serving as a warning to the church that we all need to be under the same order. And so when it's happening, when the church discipline kind of thing is happening, uh, it relates specifically to believers. You see, the believer, the one who claims to know Christ, is under this moral obligation. The one who doesn't know Jesus isn't going to respond to any kind of discipline of all or, or anything like that. So there are those who don't know Christ who will attend a church service, and they're in a different category. Non-Christians, obviously, are, are more than welcome to come and hear the message of the gospel, but sometimes a non-Christian may come in and create a bit of a problem, and they have to be dealt with. We had a guy who was coming to our fellowship for a while, and uh, he would sit up in the front row on Wednesday nights next to me. This is a few years ago. He would sit up there next to Marie and me. And I saw him one day speaking to, to uh, Jared, our worship leader, before, just before church services started. I didn't know what was happening, but it turns out he was threatening Jared. And so um, it, it, it came to the attention of, of some of my staff, and not to mine, that this person had actually gone so far as to write on social media he had written, um, I have been given the church pastorship of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. He wrote it. He said, I'll be taking over this upcoming Sunday. It'll be my first Sunday morning. And uh, come and hear me as we start a new chapter in the life of Calvary Chapel of Chino Valley. So he was usurping my authority. He was stealing my church. And I told John, that's not a good thing to do. <laughs> so... And so, so I didn't know what he had done. And so what he had done is he had, he had said, Pastor David is having a relationship with Jared. He, he's not my type, okay? But anyway. <laughs> so it was a lot worse than I thought. I didn't know what was going on, right? So he was sitting off here to the right, my right. And, you know, just as we started service today, you know, there's a time when you're seated when I come up and all of that. He wouldn't sit down. And one of my ushers, who was aware of what was taking place, approached him and said, you're going to need to sit down. And uh, the guy refused to. And he had to be removed from the service. So that happens. Those things happen. You don't want that to happen. You don't force those things to happen. But because it causes disruption and causes some problems, you have to be careful with that. You have to speak to them. You have to deal with it. And so 
uh, uh, somebody who's an unbeliever, somebody who hasn't a relationship with Christ, are going to be dealt in a different fashion than somebody who claims to have a relationship, perhaps has been a member of the, the church fellowship for a while. And so the Christian is going to be dealt with in a different way than the, uh, than the unbeliever. A church elder will normally sit down with a person and explain the situation to them, and then scripture will be applied as an encouragement to see the problem solved and repentance to occur. And that is to be done with grace, love, and understanding. You're not there to condemn and to be harsh and to be a bully. No, you're there with a graceful heart because Galatians chapter 6, 1 says it like this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so that's the spirit that it should be done in. And so Paul has already addressed this kind of thing in 1 Thessalonians. For whatever reason, they haven't dealt with it. Now he has to get involved. And he tells them in verse 6 again, withdraw yourself, withhold fellowship. When it says withdraw again, that means allow a gap to form, showing that the brother has separated himself from them. He's saying do not continue association. Don't continue being used by them. Don't continue being taken advantage of in the name of Jesus Christ because these people are not working and are expecting others to support them. And it's, it's being pointed out that this kind of selfishness will destroy the unity of the church because when somebody takes advantage of others, it causes murmuring, and murmuring will destroy the unity of the body, and unity is to be preserved. Now, Paul in verse 6 is uh, labeling those who refuse to work. He, re he uh, refers to them as disorderly and rejectors of the traditions. Now, how had they become disorderly? What had led them to stop working? It seems that based on the fact that Paul had been sharing with them that the Lord is returning for the church, a rapture is going to happen, that they just stopped working. If Jesus is coming soon, why should I be out there breaking my back? Why should I continue working? If he's coming soon, why keep on working? I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. It's true. During what has been now called the Jesus movement or the Jesus revolution, there were a few who were going out there doing exactly this kind of thing. They, they actually, I remember some who were taking their credit cards and charging them up to the limit. And they said, you know, Jesus is coming and, uh, you know, I'll leave my bill to the Antichrist, you know. And so they're still paying on that bill and it's been a long time. But that's what they were, there were some doing that. They were actually doing that. They weren't working. I remember another guy when I first got, well, actually not. I was not yet saved. I was going to a friend of mine's house, and he was a believer, and, and he was my best friend for a long time. And, and uh, he had somebody that was, we used to use the word mooching off. He, he had somebody who was coming and was staying at his house and eating all his food. And, and, and I'm not even a Christian, and I'm sitting on the, on the couch there, and I see this guy go into his, uh, my friend's refrigerator making himself food, and he was doing it regularly. And so finally, I approached my friend, and I said, why do you allow this guy to do that? Why are you allowing him to take advantage of you that way? Oh, he's not taking advantage of me. He's an evangelist. And I said, okay, what is that? I'm not a Christian. What is that? Well, he's preaching the gospel of Christ. I said, really? And so he eats free sandwiches for doing that. And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, it's your, you know, it's, your, it's your, your house. But I got tired of it. And I was there one day, and I'm just sitting there with this guy. I'm sitting with this other guy on, a, on the couch. This other guy next to me here is a Christian. I'm not. And then here goes the guy into the kitchen. I see him open the refrigerator and... And I'm starting to think, this just isn't right. And so he's opening up. He's making a sandwich for himself. He has some milk. He comes out with a, uh, a sandwich and milk and starts drinking. He looks at me. There's only two of us there. One of us is a Christian. The other's not. That's me. And he looks and he says, anybody want to get saved today? And I said, no, not today. And he goes, okay. And he goes on munching his sandwich. And I saw this kind of thing when I was first saved where people were walking disorderly. They were not doing anything. They are expecting other people to take care of them. Paul says that's not right. That's not supposed to happen. 
You're not supposed to grow lazy because you think Jesus is coming. You're supposed to be motivated and uh, you know, moved into action like it says in Romans 13, 11 and 12. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let's get busy is the point he's making, not let's get lazy. Now, in order to enhance this illustration, Paul speaks of himself in verse 7. He says, you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Now, though Paul had taught them the rapture and that it's imminent, he continued to work. That's the point he's making. He, he reinforced his moral authority. His life is consistent with his words. We need to remember that moral authority is established and kept through a consistently moral lifestyle. And so if you're living a good life, you have the authority to speak to others concerning the things that will make for them to have a good life. In Philippians 3.17, it says, Join in following my example. Note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now, we know how this works not only in a church. We know how this works in our families as a father, my, my children will look at me and my example. If I tell my son, love, you know, you need to, when you get married, you need to love your wife. But if I'm not good at loving his mother, the only example he has is what I've been. And so the way I act is how he will define love. That's the way it works. Either he'll embrace it or rebel against it, but that's his example. So if I'm going to have any moral authority, I have to practice what I preach. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, you can use me as an example. And the point he's making is, in verse 7, he said, we were not disorderly among you. Uh, we did not go out of rank. We kept our place. We discharged our duties. As a leader, you can use me as an example. And second, verse 8, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. We didn't live at someone else's expense. We didn't use other people. Verse 9, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. I can rightly receive compensation. That's what he means in verse 9 when he says, not because we don't have authority. No, I could rightly receive compensation for the work I'm doing. He had said that in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11, when he said to that church, if we've sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? In verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 9, he went on to say, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So he had the biblical right, but he didn't exercise it. He refused to use his authority in an ungodly way. His desire was to be a godly example to them, and he refused their support. In 1 Corinthians 9, 12, it, said, it says, If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So he says, I work day and night to relieve you of any burden of caring for me. I don't want to impose my needs on you. Now in verse 10, he says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, Neither shall he eat, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. If any, notice I want you to see this in verse 10, if any will not work, if anyone refuses to work, he is not to be fed by others. Do not give food to someone who is able to work, but simply will not. We need to be aware of that in our day, basically. It undermines your ability to have initiative and to do the things that are necessary for you to be advanced and to work and to see your hands blessed by the things that you're doing. And in the church, it's wrong because it causes people to 
actually have to take care of the needs that I would have when I'm capable of taking care of my own needs. And so if someone refuses to work, he's not to be fed. The point he's making is a Christian must do everything in his power to earn a living. And we're, and we're to strive to find work to support ourselves that we might be generous to others and care for our, our own families. In Titus 3.14, it says, Let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. And so there needs to be this work ethic within the body of Christ so that they're doing the best that they can and the Lord will provide in the proper way because of that. So he says in verse 11 that there are some who are disorderly and they're busybodies. That word busybody is an interesting word. It's used of a person overly inquisitive about other people's business. And that's the fruit of laziness. Busybodies who are going, they're, hey, I heard something, what's going on? Who are meddling in other people's lives. The busy body simply speaks of being busy at the wrong thing. They're busy about the trifling, the needless, or something that's useless. They're just wanting to know what's going on. He says, because they're not busy working, they're busy with meddling in your life, he says. And I don't want them to be that way. So in verse 12, he says, so, so those who are, are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So he expects people to recognize themselves for what they are. Instead of stirring up problems, work in quietness, eat your own food. But brethren, verse 13, don't grow weary in doing good. When people take advantage of you, it's easy to stop doing good. It can cause you to grow calloused to genuine needs. In our fellowship, we've had many instances where where people have, have taken advantage. Uh, uh, one lady came in on one occasion and she said she needed some help. It was right around the holiday and I said, well, we have a food pantry. This is many years ago. I said, we have a food pantry. Take what you need. And somebody came up to me later on and said, you know, we don't have any more food in the food pantry because she took every single bit of the food. And I said, oh, well, I hope that she dies. No, I, I said... I, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. But I'm not really sorry, but I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> she came in the next year and did it again. This time, you know, I said, you know, I was kind of there, but she took and she came back in a little while and she said, can, we had a tree, a Christmas tree there. She said, can I have the tree too? So she took that. And so, you know, we've had our experiences. I'll put it that way. We had a lady in the fellowship who had a need. And Marie and I, when uh, the church was, was really new, um, you know, I, I had a truck and, and a car, and I didn't put oil in the truck, and the engine seized, and so we only had one car. And Marie was working in order to supply a good portion of our income so that we could, we could live. And so uh, she was a substitute teacher here in the Chino Unified School District. My, my wife worked in a lot of the schools around here, and she worked in Chino High School. And uh, she taught Spanish in Chino High School and made good money, uh, but Marie doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> At the end of the year, neither did her students, but she did the best <laughs> that she could. <laughs> they got good grades. And so we, we, we had to supply our own needs, and somebody, some, somebody donated a car, and we didn't have a car for over a year. And so it was a little rough and, and all, and they donated a car, and it was, it, it, I said, oh, we could really use that car. I need a car, but we gave it to one of the women in the church instead who had a need. And as happened so many times, we gave her the gift and never saw her again. And well over a year later, I was standing in front of a school and she drove by and I saw the car. It had a busted windshield. It was blowing smoke in the back. She never maintained the car. It was destroyed. And I began to learn that if you give somebody, you need to give somebody something and help them to know how to use it because they didn't know how to maintain that or they would take advantage in this way. And so what happens is you can get to the point 
where you just don't want to do good anymore because you've been burned. And I've been burned on a personal level more than once. In this fellowship, we've tried to help more than once. And, and yet he says, as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Don't get tired of trying to be a blessing to somebody. Don't get tired of it. Keep on helping. Just use wisdom and exercise discernment and learn how to do that. It says in, in Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. In Hebrews 13, 16, to do good and to share, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So don't grow weary in doing good. Goes on and says in verse 14 and 15, if anyone doesn't obey our word in this epistle, note that person, don't keep company with them, that he may be ashamed. Don't count him as an enemy, admonish him as a brother. By withdrawing fellowship, you're making him aware that he has done things that are offensive. By maintaining fellowship, he thinks he's doing just fine in the Lord. And so when you withdraw, it's not because you're self-righteous and harsh. It's because you're loving them enough to, to make it known to them that in the withdrawing of fellowship, uh, that, that, that matters. Because if we really have a good relationship with brothers and sisters, when they're no longer there for us, not harsh, but they're not there with us anymore, we miss them. And that's the whole point he's making. Warn them and counsel them and, and do so in love. Uh, because if you continue uh, treating him as a believer in good standing with the Lord, you're actually encouraging him to remain in sin. So withdraw. Let him have an opportunity of seeing that he's not. And then finally, verses 16 through 18. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So he closes off and he's saying, um, without the help of God, all your efforts are worthless. May God give you strength to obey. And remember, our God is the God of peace and he can produce harmony amongst you. And may God's grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So depend on the grace of God. And, and do his will to the glory of God and may God move in your life. And finally, verse 17, again, I remind you that there were letters that were being circulated as if from Paul, who were, they were unsigned. So that's why verse 17, he says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. He's letting them know that these false letters that are circulating were not from him. And he closes his epistle by reminding them of those things and then says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and to that we say amen